At the end of the last video, uh, dealing with McIntyre's Chapter 2, uh, Moral Disagreement Today and the Claims of Emotivism, um, talked about uh, how there's, you know, there's been this decontextualization of these uh, moral terms, right? So you have this notion of terms being used outside of their original context, you know, they, they're outside of how they were originally embedded in society. And then, uh, you know, so how are you going to write the history of these terms when they've been so dislocated and, and, and sort of like this disembodied, these fragments? How, how are you going to do that? Well, one of the things that McIntyre says that is a big hindrance to even trying to do this, to try and get a handle on this, has been this uh, presupposition uh, of, of the great debate or, or the myth of the great debate. And, and what's that? Well, often when philosophy courses are taught to undergrads, um, we teach them in, in a sense, and, and there's justification for this, but it is a simplification. Um, much like the sciences, you know, talk about, oh, well, science is just a long road to truth. Uh, sometimes historians would say, oh, well, history is just the long march to, uh, you know, freedoms and rights. So there's a single kind of overarching narrative. Um, and a road to truth, a road to rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it's in philosophy sometimes it's taught like that too, in the sense that oh well, what you really have in the history, let's say, of ethics, um, is this? It's an ongoing debate. It's a great big debate about what is the good life or what is the good. And philosophers have been, you know, the standard thing that most philosophy teachers and professors don't like is when students say things like, well, philosophers for centuries have argued about you know, the good or, or what's right and what's wrong. And, and, and so Plato argued this, and then Aristotle said that, and Hume said this, um, as if it's part of this great single debate. And then you end the essay by saying, and philosophers will continue to argue about this for centuries. So it's this, this is presupposition that, uh, that it's just this, you know, Plato was arguing with Hume, who was arguing with Kant, and, and who were arguing with, and it, it, it makes it feel that it's this big conversation that everyone's present at, right? So it, it, it tends to strip it of, of, of the fact that it's temporal and, you know, these are different people at very different places and times and different places like different societies, all kinds of things. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of an obstacle, McIntyre thinks, if you think of history of philosophy like that and then you're trying to tell uh, sort of a decontextualized, a historical view of philosophy, and then you want to tell the story of the historical changes and modifications to terms like, like uh, you know, duty, ought, virtue, piety, and justice. Um, so we got to get around that a historical view that that uh, McIntyre says is this kind of this myth. It's the big obstacle, um, and uh, and and so. Uh, um, we uh, uh, we we want to say that Hume was a Scotsman, right? And and Kant was a, a Prussian. You don't want to deprive them of their cultural backgrounds um, and say, well, they're just participants in this great debate. Okay, so that's something to the side. Says uh, McIntyre, away with that. Put that to the side, um, and let's uh, uh, let, let's consider uh, uh, some further things that McIntyre talks about, um, and he considers. And in, in to sort of to get going with his own view, he uh, he plays uh, he, he he plays sort of the, the not really the devil's advocate, but he offers what someone might say in response to his discussion so far. Someone might say, "Look, okay, McIntyre, it's um, this this hypothesis you have of the disengaging of moral concepts from their embedding societies and this fragmentation of moral thinking and all this stuff that you've been talking about so far um, and changes of meaning throughout history, that's actually largely irrelevant, right? You're just fine, but it's largely irrelevant to the big problem of ethics. You are saying some big event took place in history that sort of blew up uh, everything and concepts were fragment were, or sorry systems of thinking were fragmented and concepts were just blown all over the place and then people started to pick them up you've been reading too much science fiction that's really irrelevant it's a neat story but it's just a story so says this uh, response to McIntyre um, history is not the place to look for a story to explain why you started off the book correctly that there's all this disagreement 
that was right. I agree with you there, McIntyre, but I disagree with your explanation as how we got to this disagreement. You're saying that there's a big historical thing that happened, whereas I'm going to say something like this. The reason why we have uh, endless disagreement is very simple. That's part of the way morality is. Endless disagreement is part of the very essence of morality. It's not some fanciful historical event. So going and looking back in history for the reasons uh, and, and sort of the antecedent uh, situations or events or causes, whatever you want to call them, for the roots of our current disagreement is the wrong way to go. You're looking at history. No, it's part of the very essence of morality that we just disagree with this. So don't look to history. Um, you really should think about what uh, morality really is. Okay, so morality um, is basically rationally indeterminable. It's just like this. That's the way it is. It's always been like that and it's always going to be like that. It's not some major historical thing. It's an ahistorical thing because it's part of the essence of morality itself. So, the criticism is that what McIntyre wants to present as a historical event is, in fact, part of the essence of rationality itself. So goes this criticism. So now that's a pretty good criticism, pretty damaging to McIntyre if it's right, because then all his big discussion and his thought experiment and all that, that's largely irrelevant. The only thing he's got right so far is that is the observation that there's a lot of disagreement. Um, so naturally, McIntyre is not going to take that sitting down. Um, he's going to he's, he's going to have a, a and a reply to this and and he's going to say something like this well or before i get back into his thing uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 view that the moral disagreement or sort of endless disagreement is part of the story is linked to the view of morality called emotivism all right so um so this is a 20th century I think you can find the roots of it earlier, but we'll just go along with McIntyre's text for this, that uh, that uh, a 20th century position on ethics is emotivism, and it really says that, you know, there's just real disagreement in ethics, sort of, in a way, but we'll unpack it a little bit more. But nonetheless, if you link the, if you link sort of the criticism that McIntyre offers of himself, that uh, it's not a historical event, that the disagreements are a product of the nature of, of morality itself. Emotivism says basically this. It's not a big surprise that the big attack is going to be on the claims of emotivism. That's why that's then part of this is moral disagreement today and how it's linked to emotivism, the claims that emotivism is saying. Well, that's part of the essence. All right. So big surprise that uh, McIntyre is going to spend a lot of time showing how how important emotivism is, how predominant it is, and how the goal now is for us to overcome it, right? Because it is a, shall we say, it's not what uh, ethics, ethics really is. It's a version of ethics or a window on ethics or an interpretation of ethics, which is fundamentally and flatly wrong and has led to all these disagreements. Um, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, it's been a bit of a, of, of a trick. And, um, and, and so it's wrong about the nature of ethics. And uh, uh, so, so let's look a little bit more at emotivism because it held sway for a long time. And not surprisingly, as I mentioned earlier, it was connected with logical positivism. It fit very well. A lot of the logical positivists were uh, emotivists. And, um, and it's, it's got sort of simplistic ways uh, and, 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 you know, like earlier, the earlier versions were pretty crude. And then you had more sophisticated versions of emotivism. And it still is around in some forms today, although in much more sophisticated uh, versions. Uh, McIntyre doesn't go through like a history of emotivism. But just to give you an idea, emotivism is um, uh, presented as a theory of the meaning of sentences used to express moral judgments. Um, for example, uh, here's a, I approve of, or sorry, X is good. There's a moral judgment. Yeah, that's good, right? As in, you know, like uh, kindness is good or whatever. When you're giving some kind of making a moral judgment, saying something is good or right uh, or wrong, saying, you know, murder is wrong. Well, what does, uh, uh, what does emotivism really say? It says that to unpack that, what it 
what is really going on in an ethical judgment is when you say X is good, what you're really doing is you're expressing your approval, right? So uh, sometimes uh, the emotivist said that, you know, if you say X is good, what you're really saying is hooray for X. And if you say something like murder is wrong or, or, or you know, oppression is an evil, what you're really doing is expressing your disapproval, like down, blah, yuck with uh, murder or, 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 you know, blah, I disapprove of this. And, um, and really what you're trying to do is just, you know, get others to approve and disapprove of what you do. That's really what all the, the whole story is. There's no real no rational discussion. It's just, it's just approvals and disapprovals. Um, and it's uh, sometimes when, when, you know, think of people will talk in an emotivist fashion. If you say, oh, well, I think that guy's really, uh, you know, an immoral person and he does bad things or whatever. And then someone says, ah, you just don't like him. Right. Something like that. That is roughly a kind of a motivist reaction is you. Oh, when you call them bad or a bad person or whatever, you were just expressing your disapproval. You just disapprove of them. Right. Um, you're just saying Bleh, that guy. Um, so in other words, um, it's not really the case that moral judgments are rational uh, linguistic expressions with content. No, they're just basically expressions of, of feeling and, and you're just emotive. Um, so in that sense, McIntyre says, well, then, of course, you know, if, if that's how you think uh, ethics works and well, of course, then you're just going to ethics is just agreements and disagreements and the agreements, they're not really rational. They're not. It's not a serious thing. That's not ethics. That's the wrong view of ethics. But it's around where lots of people think ethics is just that. Right. It's just the expressions of, of desires and and what you want. Now, McIntyre is going to. He's going to argue against this position. He thinks emotivism fails for several reasons. I'll just articulate a, a few here. But, um, he, he, okay, so yeah, so emotivism fails, and it's not really a theory of ethics, but it's a reaction to, and I'll get to that in a second. So why does it fail? It, it fails to really capture, uh, you know, our attitudes uh, that uh, really is what the class of ethical uh, sentences are to express, right? They, uh, um, they don't really, uh, it, it doesn't really grasp what we're up to with, with ethics. It treats uh, um, different expressions, uh, distinct expressions of personal preference and evaluative expressions. Um, he just treats them all as the same. So it's too simplistic. Um, the, you know, if the expressions of feelings on a particular uh, or an attitude is a function not of the meaning of sentences, but just of a use on a particular occasion. Um, and, uh, um, you know, this is not exactly, again, how ethical expressions really work. And um, when someone utters a moral uh, judgment like this is right or this is good, it simply just doesn't mean the same as I approve, right? He would say something is right or good and I'm not happy about it. We often say things like that, right? We, we you know, we do have, it's more, more complicated than about, about our ethics than uh, uh, the uh, emotivists and motives, emotivism says. Um, rather, so instead of really characterizing uh, what the essence of ethics is, right? Right, that emotivism says that, you know, endless disagreement is part of the essence of morality. And, and the disagreements are not, remember, are not uh, a historical descent, uh, event. McIntyre say, no, no, let's go back to the historical thesis and say that emotivism gets this wrong. This is not, and, and emotivism, this is not really even a theory of ethics. It's more of a reaction to, a reaction to what? It is a particular event. Uh, that it really was a response. Emotivism is really what McIntyre thinks, is a response to a set of theories that flourished largely, especially in England, around 1903 to about 1939. So span of, of you know, 36-ish, 30, close, close to around 40 years, um, that uh, um, it's not really concerned with moral language as such, but McIntyre thinks it's just concerned with the way that modern or moral language worked in England during this period of, of roughly 36 
ish years. So it's not really a theory of ethics. It's a particular view on ethics, but it's it's an important one and a dominant one. But in its theoretical form, uh, it's it's largely a response to certain theories. But he thinks it's emotivism in general is is you know sort of the looser kind of the one that's embedded in, inside. It's everywhere, right? But it's not really a good theory. He thinks that emotivism as kind of a quasi theory of ethics was a reaction uh, against uh, intuitionism. So you got, if you're not sure what intuition is, but this idea that we can, that we have intuitions of, uh, of certain properties that are non-physical, but are important moral properties like G.E. Obur, who thought we had an intuition of good. And of course that goes all the way back uh, to Plato. But, uh, and, and, you know, and then we have intuitions that were incapable of being, uh, shall we say, ascertained for their truth status, truth or falsity. Uh, couldn't do it. So um, the, uh, and it's not an accident that the early propounders of, uh, uh, proponents of, uh, of emotivism were, uh, were, were uh, you know, pupils of Moore and uh, they countered him. All right. So emotivism asserts that there really are no valid rational justifications for claims uh, that are objective and impersonal moral standards exist. So emotivism wants to get away with all that. And um, although McIntyre does acknowledge that a lot of most moral uh, analytic philosophers uh, reject emotivism. But nonetheless, he still thinks that, uh, and this is his main point, that this kind of emotivist approach while it may not hold as much power in uh, in terms of swaying moral philosophers of, of the time when he was writing after virtue and largely what he probably still thinks today it's still kind of embedded in the society and then, you know again think about it and watch how people talk about ethics especially when they disagree if they do sort of ah well that's just uh, your opinion and if you push a little further well that's just your opinion it's just like well that's just how you happen to feel um, then that's largely an, an emotivist kind of, uh, of, of approach. All right, so it's been embedded in our culture. Let's take a, a moment then and look a little bit more about what he means by that. <laughs> 